Hello, and welcome to Speaking Frankly, where we feature honest talk with thought leaders across the advertising ecosystem and beyond. I am Kim Frank, your host and Geopath president. So today I am so excited to be joined by Josh Chasen. He is the Chief Measurability Officer at VideoAmp and current president of the Market Research Council. Josh, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, Kim, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So let's get into a little bit of who you are and why you're here today. You were awarded very recently the incredibly prestigious Erwin Efron Demystification Award. That's for 2020 from the Advertising Research Foundation. Congratulations. So do you mind telling us all a little bit about yourself, your career, and how you got to where you are today? Sure, it'd be my pleasure. First, I would like to turn off my virtual background to share with you this hunk of hardware that you get for the Erwin Efron Award. And Ooh. let me tell you, it is, it is a substantial piece of hardware. And um, I'm honored beyond words to have received it and continue to be honored beyond words. Uh, because I considered Erwin to be uh, a colleague, a mentor, let me get my branding back, and a friend. Uh, so let me, uh, yeah, so my career, I'm, how, can I, how can I answer this? So I'll give you a little bit about my career and then I'm gonna try and turn it into advice for uh, some of our younger researchers out there. So I, I spent about seven years in the statistical services department at Arbitron uh, which I always describe to people is it would be like if you worked at Goodyear spending seven years in rubber, right? Because I really got to understand measurement. Uh, I remember the day my boss, who was the vice president of statistical services, said to me when I said something, we're going to make a sampling statistician out of you yet. Uh, so I, I really think I learned the business, you know. But I've always considered my sweet spot to be the place where marketing and measurement overlap or converge. So I've kind of been like the marketing person in measurement cap uh, capacities and measurement companies, the measurement person uh, in marketing roles. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I've, and, 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 and this, this harkens back to Erwin, frankly, one of the things that I think I've demonstrated an aptitude for, and there's plenty of things I have demonstrated no aptitude for, let me be clear about that. But one of the things I have demonstrated an aptitude for is what I used to call translating math to English, but making the complex simple. So I've gotten to be very good at understanding measurement uh, solutions and then helping others, in particular customers of my companies to, you know, to understand why what we do, uh, why we do what we do and why it is efficacious. Erwin used to tell me, Erwin used to tell me that, he used to say, I'm a researcher who writes. That's how he sort of simplified what he did. And he, by the way, he was a researcher who wrote beautifully. Uh, and uh, I very much, you know, I, I've always sort of in, in, in this profession aspired to be as eloquent about media and measurement issues as Erwin was. Uh, so after my seven years in statistical services, I spent six years in the uh, advertiser agency marketing group at Arbitron, and then four years in new venture marketing, where I was a marketing person driving our new initiatives. That took me to the internet. Uh, and then, you know, it got to the point where everybody who's anybody was quitting his corporate cushy job and joining a dot-com startup. So I figured I'd best go do that. Uh, I did, and then it became, uh, you know, September 2000 and uh, the internet collapsed and you could go to any Starbucks in Soho and they would be full of guys dressed all in black crying into their lattes, my options, my options. Um, so anyway, then I said to myself, what the dickens am I gonna do now? And I, this was a revelation for me. I read uh, Tom Peters who wrote uh, the, I think the, he wrote a lot of the management books, I think The Pursuit of Excellence, but he wrote an article called The Brand You, Y-O-U at the time, and in that article he said, in the future, our careers will be made up of the work we do, not the jobs we have, right? So in other words, we'll have projects, we'll go from project to project. So I decided at that point to stop looking for a job and start looking for work. And that led me to hang out my shingle as a consultant, Warp Speed Marketing, and uh, look for projects, uh, look, which was consulting work. And you know, basically I managed to make a living, a pretty good living for seven years, uh, 
doing consulting work and doing, as I said, research work for marketing companies and marketing work for research companies. Uh, one of those companies was Comscore. And Comscore retained me as a consultant when they decided they wanted to go through the MRC, the uh, Media Rating Council uh, process. Um, shout out to George Ivey if he's watching. And um, I consulted for Comscore for eight months and that led me to come on board and it was an exciting time to be there. It was a, a really smart entrepreneurial company learning how to be a little bit bigger company. Uh, and I was there for a long time. I was there for 13 years, liked it a lot. Um, had a, had a good time. I feel like I made an impact there, got some services accredited, did a lot of other stuff. And then uh, about 2020, uh, I, I started to think about what I wanted to do next. And, uh, you know, I started letting some of my professional colleagues know I was looking to do something different and, and move. And everybody said to me, what do you want to do next? And I realized that this is what I wanted to do next. You know, I thought I wanted to get up at like 9.30, make some coffee, read the paper, listen to music, start thinking about lunch. That's what I wanted to do. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there was something I had a passion for. And the thing I had a passion for was developing the next generation of cross-platform measurement. And every time I say that, I add right afterwards, and you really got to call it the first generation of cross-platform measurement, because probably no one's really gotten it right yet. But I think it's time. And I think uh, it's in the zeitgeist. A lot of work is getting done. I identified a group of companies where I thought a person could be a part of the development of the next generation of cross-platform measurement. Uh, about six companies. I went and interviewed at all of them. One of them was Video App. And I remember when I went to LA for a day of meetings uh, and the last meeting I had was with the CEO, Ross McRae, who I will say here at the risk of sounding like I am kissing up, I really like and respect Ross. And um, Ross said to me, okay, I know you told me you're thinking about six companies. What can I do to make Video App higher up on your list? And I said to him, you're number one on my list right now. This is where I want to be. And so, you know, after, after a little bit of time passed and we talked things through, uh, I came on board and I haven't looked back and I'm excited about it. Here's my advice, Kim. I'm sorry, I said I was going to give advice. Here's my advice. For a, long time, for a long time in my career, when I was younger, I was bummed out because I wasn't a software coder and I wasn't uh, an engineer, you know, and, and I wasn't a financial person, but I realized don't worry about what you're not, be what you are. And I was able to make my strengths, which were maybe uh, different or not standard strengths that are bankable, but I was able to turn them into a, into a career and a reputation. And my advice to people is it, it, be who you are, be who you are, uh, bang it with a trumpet. Okay. I'm gonna Love that. I, I think Dolly Parton said that. I think it was, uh... Find out who you are and do it on purpose. Do it yeah, on purpose. Amen. <laughs> amen to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. So what is VideoAmp? What do you do there? Tell us about the company. So VideoAmp, is, it's an exciting company. Uh, uh, you know, I think the short answer is you might tell somebody that it was the, in the ad tech space. And uh, a lot of what VideoAmp has done has been to manifest itself as, uh, as a DSP. But we are in the, pro but, but really from day one, and if you look at the website from day one, the mantra was, and I love a simple mantra, plan by measure. And, and, and I always add a word in there, which is refine, right? So it's plan by measure refine. It's, it's, a, it's an endless loop. It's a feedback loop. Uh, and VideoAmp has always been committed to that. And we are in the process. I don't want to say pivoting because I think pivot's the wrong word. It's not like a left or a right turn. It's more of an expansion or a realization of our mandate, which is to build the next generation of cross-platform measurement, to solve for cross-platform measurement so buyers and sellers can deploy advertising and primarily, but not necessarily exclusively video advertising uh, in an efficient fashion to meet their goals so that uh, buyers can, um, reach their true targets and reach them effectively and efficiently. And so, and sellers can uh, optimize their yield basically. So they're getting the most value for their limited, for a fixed, a fixed asset, which is inventory. So it's really starting with the objective of measuring everything 
rather than the objective of taking what exists in measurement and trying to figure out a way to combine it um, together, correct? Yeah, yeah, yes. Although we're not, you know, if we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we won't, but yeah. Got it. So you have worked really in every different media vertical, correct? I mean, it looks like from your background, you radio, television, out of home, everything. Newspaper, magazine, and digital. Yeah, yeah, Everything. I have. So yes. what is the state of measurement in each of these channels today before we can even get to a point of talking about measuring them across channels? Yeah, so let's let's talk a little bit about that, right? So let's, let's we could go measurement, we could go medium by medium. So let me, let me try to get some of them out of the way quickly. So newspapers and magazines, uh, measuring print, I, uh, and I'm, I, I fear that some of my friends at uh, MRI Simmons might might come back at me and say, "Hey, what about so and so?" There hasn't been, I don't think, a lot of revolution in measuring newspapers or print. However, the big thing with newspapers and newspapers and magazines is that uh, brands are going multi-platform, so you can read a magazine on paper, or you can read it uh, through an app like Zinio, or you can get a, a digital subscription and I think that um, there's a lot going on in that space to understand how people are using digital content and then also how um, uh, how um, the total foot, you know, to how the total footprint, how the total footprint behaves. And then where else you can find the readers of these magazine titles because you can, you know, you can cookie them or, or flag them if they're reading a digital copy and then see where else they are. So there's been a lot of innovation in measuring the digital side of print. And, and I think uh, it's challenging to, I think, really innovate the measurement of hard copy print measurement, but uh, there's been a lot of innovation overall. Radio. Uh, what I want to say about radio is that, so I worked at Arbitron when they developed PPM, and PPM has been a, a controversial breakthrough, controversial because uh, it brings electronic measurement to radio. And I don't know, I only had Pierre Bouvard, who's my old Arbitron colleague on, I think, in the last session. Pierre, Pierre and I were both sort of uh, part of the original PPM mafia uh, at Arbitron. Uh, Do you mind saying what uh, the PPM is? I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. PPM, I'm sorry, yeah, PPM is personal portable meter. And it is essentially what we called at the time a pager-like device. It's a small device that a respondent carries around with them and that can hear uh, audio, audio that is uh, within, uh, that, that is, you know, audio that's on the air, right? So it can work for radio and TV, by the way. It works for TV too. Rec uh, assuming that either the radio broadcaster or the TV broadcaster has placed the inaudible PPM code into their signal. Uh, and I believe the way the code works is it's, it takes away or what I think of as audio pixels. And so the, the device can, can hear them, can hear the signals. Um, one of the shortcomings of PPM is that it hasn't been available in all the markets. I think it's in the top 50 markets thus far. Um, so then the question becomes, how do you, how do you bring PPM further down or how do you, um, how do you do something to replace diaries? And there's something going on uh, that I want to mention in the radio space. I don't know that anybody has commercialized it, uh, fully quite yet, but a lot of in-car data is available. Uh, companies like General Motors know things. So they, they know for, uh, and, and at the so I talked to a company in the past and that company was called uh, Drive Time Metrics. I might as well give them a plug here. And, uh, and then I also actually, we, we talked to General Motors at one point and my understanding was they had like 9 million cars and it's probably, I'm probably way underselling it now, but there was like 9 million cars where they knew what radio stations were tuned in the car and the geolocation because they're, you know, they know where the car is. So you could start doing, you could start doing things like understanding how radio campaigns are driving uh, store traffic, right? Because you can, oh, uh, who, the, the people who did versus didn't hear this ad on the radio, what share of them turned out in the lot of the store? So I look at the uh, advent of in-car listening as kind of like the set-top box data for radio, right? You know, so in other words, it's incomplete and it's imperfect, 
but that doesn't mean it isn't crazy valuable. And there's a lot I think that can be done built off of that. Uh, I, I literally have no notion of whether or not uh, Nielsen Audio, which is now what Arbitron is, I have no notion of whether or not they're involved in looking at the in-car data, but I think that you know it's one of the interesting innovations in radio measurement. So that's what's happening in radio. So we hit, okay, digital has gotten harder because of, uh, you know, when, when I was at ConScore and we measured digital just by measuring what happens on computers, that was easy. Uh, and then mobile came about and mobile is much more difficult to measure because uh, you can get census data when a publishers implement tags for you or you can get log server log data. But the panel is challenging because the operating systems in mobile environments provide a lot less visibility into what's happening on the device for an app and a meter is an app, then uh, is available on computers. So it's harder to meter and measure um, mobile traffic than it is to measure computer traffic. Uh, and then it's been challenging to build up mobile panels. But uh, really uh, digital right now, I think is going to be driven by census and is driven by census measurement where you can tag or um, uh, have log file data. The things that are happening in the digital space with privacy compliance, with the death of cookies, with some of the changes that Apple is making in iOS 14, they all create challenges for digital measurement. Uh, so I would characterize digital measurement as like a, an arms race, right? Where the measurement technology moves forward, the prevention of measurement technology moves forward and uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a long dance. So um, TV, uh, a lot of great things are happening in TV measurement. Um, panel measurement uh, has been around for a long time, but of course these big data assets. So set top box data from cable operators and uh, smart, everyone calls it ACR data, but I do not, I call it smart TV data. And the reason for that is that, you know, uh, many TV meters use ACR. So ACR is the way the data is collected, but I, I think of it as smart TV data. So, so ACR so you know, being automatic content recognition. Maybe, maybe, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes, okay. ACR is I'm gonna, I'm going to dissect all your acronyms. Yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. So ACR is automated code recognition. It's It, it basically can be done for audio or video and it's uh, reading what's on the screen and running that, making it, making like a picture or a code or a snapshot or a fingerprint of what's on the screen and running that by a library of content to say, oh, this was this show. And I know that because I fingerprinted it. Uh, and so that's how the smart TV manufacturers work. So we have the benefit of being able to use smart TV data and um, set top box data in measurement solutions. And at VideoWimp, we've combined both. We use both. Um, each, each has its strengths and weaknesses. It's generally accepted that the strengths of one address the weaknesses of the other. And so it's nice to have both and to combine them. So the only medium that I don't think we've talked about yet is out of home. And, um, you know, Kim, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, Kim, you and I are professional colleagues and I'd like to think that we've become friends. And um, so can you drive me to the airport? Is that okay? I can. Um, if you wear your mask, Josh. <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway. Um, I had a lot. I had some, a lot of interaction with the, the Traffic Audit Bureau, which was what Geopath used to be called. Back when I worked, uh, actually, when I consulted for Arbitron with Erwin Efron, Erwin Efron and I, on Arbitron's behalf, did a lot of work with the Traffic Audit Bureau. And I know that we looked at things like daily effective circulations and uh, government traffic data and axle counting. And I gotta tell you, when I learned a couple of years back what you have done at Geopath with measurement, uh, with bringing uh, geolocation and cutting edge data into the measurement of physical place-based inventory, I'm gonna tell your audience what I told you at the time, I was blown away. Uh, I think you have, you and your team, I'll mention Dylan, because uh, he's, he's the one guy that I've worked with in addition to yourself at, uh, at Geopath and he deserves a shout out. But you guys have done a fabulous job of bringing the 
me the measurement of the oldest medium into the 21st century with cutting edge data and i'm going to go so far as to say that i don't know who i don't know who runs geopath but i hope they're thinking about giving you a big fat raise is all i can say <laughs> thank you josh um, that's, uh, really, that's great to hear thank you you've revolutionized, uh, you've revolutionized place based measurement and it's impressive thank you so much so and you used to work in out of home measurement with Erwin. so what were you doing for uh the TAB? Well, well, so it was uh, more like, I did one project with the TAB and that was when Anna Fountas was there. She asked me to work with them on uh, writing some uh, decks and material, but mostly I was consulting for Arbitron with Irwin and we were working on Arbitron's uh, forays into the um, out of home measurement space. And I, I'd like to think that what we did presaged a teensy bit what's going on now because what we did was we brought we tried to bring the science of traffic flow measurement and the traffic and the science of audience measurement together and uh, i feel like you know there's papers somewhere that we wrote that were you know if you blow the dust off of them then you probably find that they're interesting and 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 uh, a little bit before their time we'll have to dig those up when we get back to the office. So uh, it sounds like all of the different media have their own challenges and their own technology. So where does that leave us when we're talking about measuring things across platforms? So when the subject of cross-platform comes up, I always want to go to the World Federation of Advertisers, right? So couple of years, maybe, uh, I think it was maybe 2019, the, the World Federation of Advertisers began an initiative um, to define and engineer the next generation of cross-platform measurement with the, from the perspective or the point of view of the advertiser, what does the advertiser want? And it turns out that this is what the advertiser want, wants. For every impression that is served, the advertiser wants to know what device that impression went to what household that device rolls up into, what person or persons were in front of the screen, um, what other impressions made it to that device, household and person so that we can understand unduplicated reach. Uh, what targeting attributes can we associate with device, household and person? Because we're not looking to target women 18 to 49, we are looking to target uh, auto intenders or, um, uh, heavy purchases of macaroni and cheese or you know whatever the true target is uh, and they want all of this done in a privacy compliant fashion and that may seem paradoxical to have that level of granular data and yet to keep it privacy compliant but when you make those the goals you can start figuring out how to do it so the and, and so the World Federation, WFA, with the help of many companies, notably Facebook and Google, uh, who had done a lot of science in this area, sort of you know, designed uh, a construct for this. And now it is being pursued locally. And, and locally in, in this lexicon means in the United States through the ANA and in the UK through ISPA. Um, so one of the things that is important here is to develop a, a set of privacy compliant IDs, which are called VIDs, virtual IDs, that enable different data assets from different media companies to be combined so that true reach and frequency can be parsed, but without media operator A learning about media operator B's audience in a fashion that they ought not. So what's happening now is this advertiser-driven, extremely well-resourced industry initiative globally and in two countries to develop this cross-platform measurement solution. Now, I'm also gonna say that being a dyed-in-the-wool capitalist, I get a little wary of industry initiatives as the best way to solve problems, because I like to think that innovation and entrepreneurship are the best ways to solve industry problems. However, however, the cooperation and the, um, the uh, insights that have emerged from this work 
And the articulation of need and demand has been invaluable. And however the solutions get engineered, I, I think we're gonna know that the World Federation of Advertisers and that, that initiative has been a big part of the process. Um, so you've mentioned something about um, combining data and I'm gonna just go off a little bit off topic for a moment. Um, you were talking about not only measuring across different platforms, but also across different publishers. So I know mm -hmm. sometimes we um, talk about walled gardens. Um, yeah. Do you mind just spending a little bit of time talking about what a walled garden is and how that becomes like one more layer on top of the measuring across channels? There's also the measuring across publishers issue. Hey, Kim, that wasn't on our list. I know. No, is that <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Just you so wait. <laughs> when we, so, yeah, uh, just you wait. When we talk about wall gardens, what we mean is we're talking about companies, and often, often wall garden becomes a euphemism for Facebook and Google, but also Amazon, and really many, many uh, media companies. You, uh, Comcast, for example, could be construed as a wall garden. These are companies that have two, I'm, I'm going to describe it like this. There are companies that have two extremely valuable assets. One asset is a ton of data about their users with whom they have first party relationships. And the second asset is uh, an obligation to protect both the privacy and the user experience of those uh, users, of those customers. So for example, I know that, and I don't, I don't wanna name any companies because I don't wanna misattribute policies, but for example, some of these companies, when I was, when I was in my previous position, when I was a Comscore, some of these walled gardens did not want us to tag their content uh, because they were very concerned that tagging, a tag is one more thing that has to load and fire, which could introduce some latency and thus affect user experience. So user experience is paramount for companies that, hey, look, when you serve a billion consumers, consumer experience is extremely important. Uh, so consumer experience is important. Privacy is important. And if you look at Apple, for example, Apple makes privacy protection a part of their value proposition. So what happens is, Oftentimes, the best way to get data from a media plan is, so let, let's say you're talking about, let's say you have a media plan and you're measuring 20 television networks and two digital walled gardens, okay? So you, you have ratings for the TV networks and you can understand how they work in aggregate, but you probably can't measure the walled gardens in the, and by the way, that's what we, what we mean by walled is there's walls around them. There's, prohibitions on, on penetration. So oftentimes uh, these walled gardens will make lots of data available within their walled garden. But now the question becomes, okay, you as an advertising agency, as an advertiser, you don't want to just know how your ads worked with these guys and these guys and those guys. You want to know how they work holistically and together. So the challenge becomes, how can we kind of get the data out of the wall gardens and you look at it holistically and understand how it works with other media. Um, again, both, you know, not to keep picking on the two companies that account for 70% of the ad spend in digital, but they do account for 70% of the ad spend in digital. Um, so uh, Facebook and Google have both developed, uh, they make a lot of data available to their advertisers and they've both developed constructs for data sharing. They're also, I think to their credit, and I'm, you know, it's very easy and popular to be a, a detractor of these companies, but I gotta tell you, I'm a fan of both of these companies. And I mean that as a consumer and as also as a, as a professional. They both um, are very, very proactive in helping the industry to engineer the kind of privacy compliance solutions like virtual IDs, like the other identity construct, which is assumed, I think that stands for secure universal uh, media ID or marketing ID. Um, they're both been pretty, uh, pretty proactive about recognizing that we need to, the, prob the problem they have to solve is 
how do I protect my user experience? How do I protect my user privacy and still meet the needs of my advertisers who want to understand how all these media platforms work together? Uh, and I think they and we collectively are pretty optimistic that the answer is science, computer science, data science. But I, yeah, I think that we can get there. Thank you. I, I, you know, I don't know how much people in the out of home industry know what the walled garden expression means, but I know we do hear it a lot. So um, the other word you mentioned that I want to go back to a couple of times is one of our geopath words also, and that is don't say impression. <laughs> so it is a hot topic. Well, and it has been, honestly, it's been a hot topic, I think, in the 25 some odd years that I've been a, a media researcher, is what is an impression? Is it an opportunity to see impression? Is it a viewability metric? In out of home, we use likelihood to see impressions. Then we hear things about marketers want more engagement metrics. So, so what is an impression? Yeah, so when I think about defining impressions, there are two issues that come up for me always. Uh, and they're the logical two. Once I, once I say them, you'll say, yeah, certainly. One of them is uh, what are advertisers consider to be an impression? What do they want to, to create, right? And then the other thing is um, when does the media vehicle get paid? Because, right? So there is opportunity to see, uh, which is to say, and, and, you know, from viewability and digital, I, I always have, I've, conceptualize the opportunity to see as the ad makes it onto the screen. Although now that I think about your business, um, by definition, you know, if you take out a billboard, your ad is on the billboards and now the question becomes who is in the sight line of that, right? So I think that we have to start thinking about uh, getting, creating an opportunity to see, a legitimate opportunity to see. In other words, the ad is on the screen and the ad is, and the screen is in a place where it can be confronted by the eyeballs of an audience person, right? Um, I think that, so, you know, there's also been talk about, oh, oh, oh you know, advertisers should only pay for performance, but, you know, what if you run a lousy ad and you've taken up valuable scarce inventory on a TV network to do so? Uh, they really shouldn't be punished for the performance of your ad. So I've always kind of felt like the job of the media vehicle is to lead the horse to water. Uh, so I think an impression is opportunity to see an eyes on. So a bit of a combination of what's going on in terms of it the ad appeared on the screen, but also then the consumption of that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm also going to say that I think that media vehicles sh should be paid before we quantify eyes on. They've led the horse to water, right? But if I'm, you know, in this day and age, if I've delivered millions of people to my program on, 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 on live network TV, and then the commercial comes on and everybody under the age of 35 is now looking at their phone. Uh, you know what? The network has still put that ad on the screen in my living room. And, and I believe they should be paid for that. So then the currency would be impressions, not click-throughs or not conversions. So it's about media delivery, not the eventual outcome or footfall or click through or purchase? So I think these are areas of negotiation for buyer and seller. Um, the, the, the message I, 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 I guess I wanna echo is that inventory for many media vehicles is scarce. In other words, there are only so many slots that you can put a commercial. And should it, you know, if we're going to pay for performance, there's got to be a way to do that that doesn't penalize the media vehicle. If, you know, so what if, what if, what if you're advertising an Edsel? You know what I mean? Like, not every product is a hit. And I don't think it's fair to the media vehicle. I don't think it's fair to the network. I don't think it's fair to the billboard company to, uh, for them not to get paid because your product is a dog. Yeah. 
if, if in fact that's the case. Unless your product is a dog, because who doesn't love a dog? Everyone loves it. Only good people love dogs. Everybody loves a dog. So Josh, I'm going to change gears a little bit. Early on in the conversation, I mentioned that you are the current president of the Market Research Council. Do you yes, mind you telling us what the Market Research Council, aka the other MRC is and what they do? Oh, look, and you even came with your own background. Brilliant. <laughs> yes, I'd be happy to do so. And I'm going to change the background. Yeah. So the Market Research Council, and uh, again, full disclosure to uh, Kim's loyal audience. Um, so I'm the president of the Market Research Council this year. And the way it works is that if you get elected, you're secretary treasurer, and then the following year, you're vice president, and then the following year, you're president. And Kim is the vice president now, so she will follow me as president next year. And so we've had the opportunity to, to work together for the Market Research Council. The Market Research Council, which we'll hereafter refer to as the MRC, is the, uh, the oldest organization of its kind in America, which is really, it's a professional association for market researchers. And it was founded in New York City in 1927 by people whose names are recognized now because they are the names of companies. So it was founded by people like Roper and Nielsen and Starch and Politz. And I, 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 I kind of look at it as originally having been a group where these colleagues uh, wanted to get together and talk shop. They wanted to talk about market research and the developments. Um, it is, so the main thing that the group has done historically is have a lunch every Friday during the business year, which is to say not the summer, uh, every Friday, once a month, one, one, once a month is a Friday lunch where we uh, socialize with each other, but there's content. There's a presentation on some important burning topic of the day. And then we also maintain a hall of fame, a market research hall of fame. So what we've as an organization been learning is a few things. One is that Obviously, market research is no longer just market research. It is market research, it is uh, media research, it is data analytics, it is uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, it is data science. Uh, and so it is a, a profession that has exploded really. A and so we are working to make sure that the organization keeps up with all those um, flavors. We've also recognized that um, it is no longer a New York City or a New, a New York centric uh, profession. Uh, it might have been in 1927, but we recognize now that many prospective constituents of, constituents of the Market Research Council are uh, throughout the US, throughout the world. So in a sense, COVID has been a sort of uh, blessing in disguise because like everything else, like everyone else, we've gone virtual. And because we've gone virtual, you no longer need to live close enough to the Upper East Side of Manhattan to come to our luncheons, uh, or the mid, I should say the mid, mid, Midtown East, Midtown East. Uh, basically the, the luncheons are across the street from Grand Central Station on Fridays so that in 1927, you could go catch the 205 back to Westchester. Um, but so yeah, we've had that we've been able to make all of our events virtual. Uh, once we come back to luncheons, we'll probably still say virtual. We want to make this an organization that uh, is valuable to practitioners in all areas of market research. Um, find us on the, find the website, you know, if you're interested in, in, in becoming a member. Um, we've had some great content this year. Uh, our next event, I think, I don't think we've pinned the day down yet, or, or, or at least we haven't announced the day, but it'll be uh, second half of March and it's going to be on uh, the topic of machine learning and artificial intelligence in, uh, in market research. We are trying to keep, we're trying to stay very topical and current and make it, uh, uh, make it a group that market research professionals at all stages of their career can feel like they're getting something from it. Um, Joining the group requires nominee, nomination from a member and a second by a member. Um, let us know, you know, let Kim know, let me know. If you're interested in becoming a member, we'd be thrilled to have you. So Josh, I'm gonna give you one more question. Speaking frankly, sure. if you could put one message out to the world on all of the out-of-home advertising that's out there, what would it be? 
You know, I, I thought about this and I, and, I, and I wish I had a cleverer answer than I do, but I do have an answer. And, and this is what I think my message would be. It would be stop looking at your phones and start looking at each other. Oh, I love that. That's great. Stop looking yeah. at your phone, start looking at the billboards. <laughs> yeah. well, but, but, but you will have read this on the billboard. No, and, and I, mean, I, mean that, I mean that I mean that because I think we're all drawn too far into technology. And I think that, you know, this, this partisan divide we have in this country is encouraged by the media spheres that we end up drawn to because algorithms tend to push us apart. And let's put the phones down. Let's look at each other. Let's talk to each other. And uh, I, that, that's my message, I guess. And, and because I understand the power of out-of-home advertising, that's probably what I'd want to see on every billboard in America. Amazing, Josh. Thank you so much. I can't wait for that us to fun. not have a device between us so we can have like a real human lunch again. I know. Just dying to see I know, you. I know. I Thank know. you Likewise. so much. Likewise. Thank you so much, my friend. You are, as always, a media research, marketing research rock star. I am privileged to be your friend and your peer, your colleague. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you everyone who listened or watched. Uh, it's really been fun. So if anyone has any questions for me or for Josh, you can email us at geekout at geopath.org with the subject line, speaking frankly questions. Thank you again, yes. Josh. And same to you, Kim, everything you said, I echo back to you. And I also just want to say, I know, that, I know that a lot of my friends from back when I did consult on the out-of-home business in the early 2000s are still in the business. And I just want to say hello to everybody. Awesome. Have a fabulous day and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks.